Okay, I then propose that we get started. Uh, probably we'll have a few more participants joining us over the, the next few minutes. Um, welcome to all of you. My name is Aziza Akmush. I'm uh, head of the division at the OECD that uh, deals with cities, urban policies and sustainable uh, development uh, within a, a directorate called the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And I'm delighted to be your host and moderator for the coming hour and a half. Let me start with um, big thanks to all of you and to our distinguished panelists for uh, your time today. And we know uh, it's been challenging for some of you because we have participants both from the East and from the, the West uh, in terms of, of time zone, but we're uh, delighted uh, we have such a broad representation of uh, OECD member and partner countries. And let me add to this a few housekeeping arrangements before we get started. First, to tell you all that this webinar is being recorded uh, and that the recordings will be made available on the web page of our program on energy efficiency uh, for buildings over the coming days and thus give um, the opportunity for more uh, participants uh, than the 120 plus registered for this webinar to listen to the interesting conversation uh, coming soon. This is a webinar format, as you've seen, uh, which means that uh, not all of you uh, as attendees will be able to take the floor. We hence advise that you use the Q&A icon to uh, convey questions you may have for each of the six uh, panelists or for the OECD uh, secretariat, and that you do so um, uh, as, as you can uh, progressively so that we uh, can manage the pipeline of questions and make this discussion as interactive as um, possible. We're uh, really thrilled to uh, start this uh, conversation on decarbonizing uh, buildings in cities and uh, regions, energy efficiency for a green uh, recovery from COVID-19. And we'll be hearing from uh, different types of stakeholders during the panel and having a good half an hour for uh, Q&A and, and interaction with uh, all of you in, in the second part of the, of the webinar. And in between, a few opportunities to engage you via two Zoom polls uh, where we would like to invite all of you um, to vote and submit your preferences on two specific questions um, that the Secretariat will be asking. Let me start uh, by uh, uh, introducing a few words uh, as to why this topic is uh, important but also both timely and relevant for the OECD today. And then uh, we'll hear uh, a more uh, detailed uh, scene setting uh, from the head of this program, uh, my colleague Atsuito Oshima, before different members uh, of the panel uh, share their views and ongoing work uh, they're doing in this area, either at country specific level, and we'll be hearing from the Netherlands, from Japan and from France, or at subnational level, and we'll be hearing from British Columbia at supranational or more international level, and we'll be hearing from the European uh, Commission and also from the Development Bank uh, perspective. And this will give us a pretty good understanding of uh, who is doing what in this field and where uh, synergies and complementarities can uh, be built. Buildings are, as you know, a very important component of the low carbon transition in, in cities. And while uh, buildings account for nearly a third uh, of the energy related greenhouse gas emissions globally, these percentages can even reach 70% in uh, cities like London, Tokyo, and New York. And it's estimated from a recent report we have co-authored with the Coalition of Urban uh, Transitions that 90% of the urban emissions can be eliminated by 2050 if we actually engage in the radical transformation that we know uh, uh, is needed to green uh, our economies and using technically feasible but also widely available measures these significant uh, emission reductions should come primarily from the building sector, up to 58%, uh, according to that report. 
We also know that energy efficiency in building generates multiple benefits, including job creation, health benefits, and increased energy uh, efficiency and, and affordability. And it's this combination between the environmental, the economic, and the social case for uh, energy efficiency in building that actually sheds light on, on those co-benefits. Uh, and we know, last but not least, that this conversation about energy efficiency in building that may have seen the big technical only a few uh, years back it has gained a lot of traction as part of the COVID-19 recovery and we see a, a big chunk of national uh, recovery packages that were uh, uh, developed by OECD countries but also at the EU uh, recovery fund uh, level that have energy efficiency in building as a key component, not only for environmental, but also for social uh, reasons. And this is where for us local governments are, are playing a significant role, not only because they're responsible for core policies at local level that are intrinsically linked to that transition to low carbon economy, whether it's land use or housing or uh, urban mobility or drinking water and sanitation, but also because they discharge quite a significant amount of the public uh, spending and, and public uh, investment that goes uh, into these areas. And I hope this webinar will give us an opportunity to um, make the case for those local and, and, and regional interventions, but most importantly, uh, for this multi-level governance that is needed across uh, levels of government to get um, this green transition right. So this is uh, a bit of background uh, to set the scene, as I was saying, and now uh, we would like to uh, hear from you. And we would like to invite all the members of the panel, but also all the participants who are online uh, to take part in the following uh, Zoom poll that you will see uh, shortly appear on your screen. And here is the question for which we ask you to pick your two top choices. You could, of course, tick all these boxes, but we would like you to uh, uh, raise the two top ones. What are the main challenges for low carbon transition in buildings? Is it weak regulations and insufficient implementation capacity? Is it the lack of strategic approach to address building stock as a whole? Is it the lack of flexible financing options for energy efficiency renovation? Is it the difficult decision-making process in energy investments, multifamily residents, and so on? Is it the fragmentation of initiatives across sectors and levels of government, or is it something else, other? And if you click on other, if you could be kind enough to drop via the chat um, examples of what you would put behind the other. I see numbers are still going up. Uh, we have a good 50% of respondents who have um, already ticked two boxes so far. So we'll wait for an additional 10 seconds. Once you have clicked your, on the two options, you just click on submit and then your uh, poll will be uh, accounted for. We probably have a good 20 people to go. Maybe we wait uh, 20. Yes, this is going up. Maybe we wait a good 10 seconds and then uh, Mia, I'll invite you to close the poll. Meanwhile, we see a few interesting suggestions in the chat, uh, the political prioritization, the lack of awareness and incentives um, for end users and citizens, very interesting. Okay, I see numbers are stabilizing. So maybe Mia will invite uh, the Secretariat now to close the poll and to share the results. Okay, sorry, my screen has froze at end polling. Okay. Jonathan. Good, and now share the results. Very good. So what is coming, oops. Do we have, maybe if someone clicks on share the results, I don't see the, no, okay. Or if you need time to do that, I can uh, leave you a few seconds and then uh, after the scene setting, we come back and see the results. 
I believe we will have to relaunch. Okay, so this is the relaunch. So let me re-invite all of you, sorry, better twice than none. The good thing is that you know now the questions by heart. We said this is a warm up exercise, so we're definitely getting warmed up here. Excellent, I see a good third of participants have responded. Let's take an extra 10 seconds. We have now over half. So different suggestions between regulation, the strategic approach, financing options, decision-making and fragmentation of initiatives. I see numbers are stabilizing more or less. So Mia, if you can now stop the poll and share the results. Good. Everybody should be seeing on the screen now what has come first, meaning the lack of flexible financing options for energy efficiency, followed very closely by the lack of strategic approach um, to address building stock as a whole, and then equally by the weak regulation and the fragmentation of initiatives. And we've also taken due notes of the um, different suggestions that were provided via the chat. Thank you very much. Let's stop sharing the screen. Thank you to the team. And let me now turn to my colleague Atsuito, who will be presenting in a good 10 minutes. This is certainly not um, doing justice to uh, the magnitude of the work that has been completed so far. But Atsuito, you have 10 minutes to set the scene. Thank you, Adriva. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, Panelists, all, all the panel participants, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Uh, my name is Atsuhito Oshima. Uh, with this presentation, I would like to present several reasons why the roles of cities and regions are important in decarbonizing buildings and briefly introduce OECD program to support a whole of government approach to energy efficiency in buildings. So next slide, please. So first, I would like to quickly go over the global context of energy efficiency in buildings. Looking at the right uh, recent increase in total energy use per square meter uh, in buildings globally, the main driver is the floor area growth. From 2000 to 2017, that the energy use per square meter has improved by 25%, but the floor area growth has increased by 65% in the same period. Now, emerging economy and the advanced economy have different contexts. Emerging economies will account for 85% of the global floor area growth by 2050. So the focus should be on new construction. On the other hand, advanced economies have slow population growth, stable purchasing power, and slow turnout rate of buildings. So the focus should be more on renovation of existing buildings. Next slide, please. To improve the energy intensity of buildings, renovations are the key, as most buildings are old and not energy efficient. For example, in the EU, about half of existing residential buildings were built before 1970 and before the first thermal regulations were introduced. Old buildings are about five times less energy efficient than modern buildings with regard to their summer, summer performance of building envelopes. Furthermore, the percentage of new construction per existing building stock is very small, which is about 1% in the EU, for example. In sum, energy efficiency renovations are the key, and it will also contribute to green recovery from COVID-19, as it also generates jobs, health benefits, and energy affordability. Next slide, please. While national policies provide 
a variety of tools and set the framework for energy efficiency in buildings, we also need to look at the local and regional context. First, energy consumption itself differs across regions. The share of greenhouse gas emission from residential sector is larger in metropolitan regions compared to smaller cities or rural areas. Best performing regions generally consume three times less energy at home than worst performing regions within the country. Cities, suburbs, and rural areas have very different contexts in various aspects, such as building stock composition, population and floor area growth, and poverty and affordability. Such place-based evidence is crucial in order to make targeted decisions about policy priority uh, across different places. Next slide, please. Energy efficiency policies in buildings are not only a tool for environmental purpose. For example, excess winter mortality is associated with housing quality and deprivation. In Japan, excess winter mortality is low in the regions with higher per percentage of energy efficient housing. In Portugal, a study found a significant correlation between excess winter mortality and housing deprivation. In fact, in the graph on the right, housing depri deprivation differs across places and is generally higher in cities compared to suburbs or rural areas. In addition, poverty, energy affordability, housing affordability, all vary across places, which require careful attention to vulnerable people also in energy efficiency policies in building. Next slide, please. Energy efficient, efficient renovations have local impacts as key suppliers are local. Most construction firms are small and medium sized firms, and these firms are more vulnerable to sudden disruption and rapid changes caused by COVID 19. Investment in energy efficiency in buildings will generate local jobs and benefits, benefit local economy, but at the same time, policies also need to support local businesses. In addition, energy efficiency renovations involve a diversity of suppliers. This include construction, consulting, architecture, building inspection, uh, real estate, utility, uh, utility companies, financial services. In order to upscale energy efficiency investment in buildings, private businesses need to provide consolidated and easy packages for property owners, which requires a significant collaboration among these stakeholders and public institutions. Next slide, please. Considering these diverse geographical contexts, the local nature of buildings and policy environment, cities and regions have unique ability to contribute to effective implementation. First, cities and regions are familiar with key local factors such as composition of the existing building stock, housing and energy affordability. City can factor in these local elements and take strategic approach to building stock. Second, cities and regions can leverage public building procurement uh, for energy efficiency in buildings. Subnational governments account for 60% of public investment in OECD countries. It is not only for setting minimum standards for buildings, but also for awareness raising, awareness raising among citizens, testing for new technologies, and skill development of local firms. Next slide, please. Cities and regions are already taking ambitious and innovative local actions, such as ambitious regulations, advanced pilot developments, and new business models. For example, the city of New York has introduced very ambitious Climate Mobilization Act, which caps carbon emissions from large existing buildings. Cities and regions can engage citizens and local businesses effectively, including assistance to low-income low households, 
and one-stop shop services for citizens. It is also very important to bundle these past renovation needs, including social housing, and bring in private investment to local renovation market. Next slide, please. Now, cities and regions are facing challenges uh, at the local, local scale. So clearly, national governments can play a vital role to create enabling uh, environments for cities and regions. Given this context, OECD program uh, building energy efficiency in cities and regions has a clear objective to support uh, countries, regions, cities in developing a more strategic whole of government approach that considers local policy conditions and maximize subnational strengths. Uh, this is composed of three key components. First is to enhance exchange uh, knowledge sharing and peer learning on innovative approaches, uh, best practices, and more through international seminars and in-country policy dialogues. Second one is case study, tailored case study on uh, data and pol policy framework. And this includes the uh, policy dialogue between key stakeholders in countries regarding building energy efficiency. The third component is self-assessment tool for cities and regions to assess policy conditions, progress, and outcomes. So the challenge here is to uh, build a strong evidence cities and regions action and create a governance framework for multi-level governance in building energy efficiency. The program will take place from uh, January next year, and it will uh, it will be uh, you know a year program. And in the next uh, three two three months, uh, we are expecting to convene participants and officially launch the program. Next slide, please. So the questions for discussions, uh, especially for the panel discussion. Uh, here is a list of our main discussion points, and uh, uh, these are what are the major policy challenges, what are the key law, what key laws can cities and regions play, how can national governments support cities and regions, and what are the impact and implications of COVID-19. So next slide please. So thank you for your attention. And uh, for more information on the program, uh, please feel free to contact me and to check out our website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Atsuito. A uh, very interesting uh, presentation, uh, which I hope uh, clarifies the intended scope and rationale for this new piece of work uh, under your, your leadership. Let us now move to the uh, panel. We'll have uh, six uh, distinguished panelists that will uh, share their own experience and, uh, and work uh, in this area in response to the uh, four questions that were put on the screen, uh, namely how to understand the main barriers, obstacles, challenges uh, to that uh, decarbonization of our buildings at local level, um, what is a, a, a greater role subnational governments could play, but also uh, national governments in terms of promoting, facilitating, enabling uh, that decarbonization, and uh, to what extent has COVID-19 uh, changed or not uh, any of the of the uh, context uh, that can drive this uh, transition. So let me now start by uh, the two countries that have championed uh, the program and, and their respective initiatives. And let me thank them for uh, really uh, leading the way uh, in terms of being the first ones to uh, jump in the consortium of, uh, of dialogues and uh, cases that we are forcing for this work. And I'll start with uh, Joram Snijers, uh, senior policy official in the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom uh, of the uh, uh, Netherlands, sorry. 
Um, we know that the Netherlands has nurtured uh, quite an innovative uh, initiative, actually a set of innovative initiatives on uh, deep energy uh, renovations. I think many of us have uh, long heard about the Energy Sprong uh, initiative amongst others, and uh, you'll be uh, presenting to us, Joram, some of the Dutch uh, building stock, uh, the climate agreement with uh, key stakeholders and the district uh, interesting approach that uh, you have developed whereby municipalities are also taking the lead. Uh, Joram, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Aziza. Thank you all for uh, inviting me here today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, let me first say that I'm very also very glad that the OECD is starting this program because I look very much forward to cooperating with other OECD members on this very important topic. I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered with regard to the energy transition in the built environment. And there's a lot that we can learn from uh, other countries uh, if we share uh, experiences and best practices. Um, so I, I, I recommend every uh, one watching this webinar today to also have a look at the program and hopefully they can participate. So I don't have much time, so I'll, I'll get right into the, the perspective from the Netherlands. I will tell you a little bit more about what we are doing in our country. So uh, next slide, please. To start, I would like to give you a little bit of context of what uh, the situation in the Netherlands is. So of the 8.5 million buildings approximately that we have in the Netherlands, uh, 1.6 million buildings were built before 1940. And Atsuito already mentioned that energy performance is uh, a big, um, there's a big difference in older buildings and they are often um, not very uh, well insulated. So the energy performance is poor. So you can imagine with a, a relatively large older building stock, there is a big variety in energy performance in the Netherlands. And that's uh, one of our first challenges. Another thing that I want to emphasize is the high dependence on natural gas that we have in the Netherlands for heating. So in fact, 88% of Dutch households use individual boiler heating systems powered by natural gas, and only 12% use district heating or something else. So that means if we want to decarbonize uh, our heat and want to uh, have a good energy transition in the built environment, we have to do something in pretty much every building in the country. We have to change the individual heating systems. We have to look at insulation. We have to look at renewable energy, etc. So you can, man can imagine that is quite a big challenge. Um, next slide, please. So to tackle this, um, challenge, if I can go to, yes, there it is. Uh, the, the Dutch government decided to work on a Dutch national climate agreement, uh, which was agreed upon in 2019. Over the course of one year, uh, the government negotiated with more than 100 different parties about what should be done to reach the climate targets uh, in the Netherlands. And one of the topics, one of the five topics that was discussed was the built environment. And pretty much at the beginning, it became already apparent that there are a couple of main challenges that need to be solved. For example, affordability. Who is going to pay for the big investments uh, needed in our buildings? Who is going to pay and how are we going to pay for that? Uh, the, the second challenge was speeding up the process. So as I mentioned, we need to do something in pretty much 8 million buildings uh, in the Netherlands before 2050. How are we going to do that in time? We really need to speed up the renovation process to achieve that. And then uh, another important one is the public support and participation. So with the energy transition in the built environment, you literally come behind the front door of people where they live and where they work. So it's very important that they are involved in the process as well. And that's why that in the, the conclusion of the Dutch National Climate Agreement was that municipalities should have a big role in uh, the planning and coordination of the decarbonization of the built environment. So municipalities in the Netherlands uh, are working on a lot of different policy measures at the moment to achieve this. And a uh, I will give a couple of examples. So for example, the regional energy strategies is at the regional level, um, a, a strategy of where and how the available renewable energy and sustainable heat can be divided among different regions. So it's, of course, a scarce resource. So how can you divide it fairly between different cities, 
towns in a particular area and basically make this very complicated puzzle of supply and demand, how to make it fit. Uh, more on the local level, we work on the heat transition vision and heat transition plans. Uh, it basically means that all municipalities in 2021, they have to be finished, will uh, develop plans on what district, what neighborhood will get what type of alternative to, in our case, natural gas and when. Uh, that's not only important for the projects themselves, for the planning and the business case, but also for the people living and working in that particular neighborhood, so that they will know my neighborhood is up for renovation and a change in energy system then and then, so that they can also take that into account when they uh, think or consider private investments in their building. And then finally, the district oriented approach real quick. Next slide, please. Um, in the Netherlands, we have decided that uh, the district level is the, uh, one of the appropriate levels to tackle this issue, uh, especially existing neighborhoods, making them sustainable, making them natural gas free uh, is very complicated. We have never done that before on such a large scale, so we don't really know how to do that. So that's why we have started a pilot program with 46 uh, pilot neighborhoods at the moment, where we want to learn, share knowledge and experience with different types of heating and insulation techniques in different types of neighborhoods and different types of buildings. And the real goal of this is to figure out what works and what doesn't work so that we, that we know uh, uh, how to do this best. And the municipalities are also in the lead for this district oriented approach. They have submitted plans to the national government and the national government has provided financial support of around 4 million euro per neighborhood uh, and a national knowledge sharing platform to facilitate this process and to make sure that the lessons learned on one side of the country are also shared with uh, participating pilot neighborhoods on the other side of the country and of course all municipalities that might not already have a pilot neighborhood. So these were just a, a few examples of what we are doing. I have to be very short so I can imagine there might be questions. Please feel free to ask them during the panel or contact me after that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jora. I'm extremely enlightening to see um, the three S's behind your presentation, what you've uh, come up with in terms of strategy, how you've uh, aligned the planets between the different stakeholders, and also how you've addressed the issue of scale, um, notably through this uh, district approach that I'm sure will uh, trigger a few questions. If you have questions for Joram, please uh, raise them as uh, three of you have done already uh, via the Q&A function and we'll um, maybe have uh, some time in between uh, the six panelists to take a few questions and then move to the second block. Let me now turn to our second speaker and it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Harunobu Murakami, who's the director uh, of the International Affairs Office within the Housing Bureau Bureau of the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism of Japan. And very interestingly, Japan has recently announced its uh, target to achieve a, a carbon neutral uh, society by 2050. And uh, you'll be presenting to us some of the regulations, financial support and, uh, and uh, other instruments that uh, you have put forward to support uh, uh, small construction firms uh, and generate those health uh, benefits in uh, the most aging country uh, uh, that Japan uh, is, uh, and, and that probably raises a number of challenges that are uh, country specific. Uh, Harunobu, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, today, I'm happy to have this opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, my name is Murakami from Japan. Uh, now I start my presentation on decarb decarbonizing in Japan. Uh, uh, slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, at first, I would like to introduce uh, Japan's low carbon policy. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding the situation of the nation, uh, it was announced that a new prime minister will be appointed in September of this year, and that. Uh, a carbon neutral society will be built by the year of 2050. Uh, next, uh, regarding cities and regions, the number of local governments 
that have recently made a zero carbon city uh, declaration is increasing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, I would like to introduce the measures in Japan. Uh, low carbonization of housing and buildings in Japan is based on the Building Energy Conservation Act. Uh, based, on, uh, based on this act, the national government has established a regulatory framework and established uh, energy efficiency standard. On the other hand, uh, local governments are confirming the uh, specific enforcement of this act, that is uh, compliance with energy uh, efficiency standards. In addition, some local governments have introduced an environmentally considerating uh, building system and a system called CASB that comprehensive, comprehensively evaluates the building environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is about uh, national support for low, car low carbonization. There are three uh, issues, three main issues. The first one is financial support. Uh, the national government is working to raise the level of uh, energy efficiency uh, by supporting advanced pilot project relating to energy efficiency. In addition, we hold seminars for general public and industry to improve the bottom up. Uh, next slide, please. The second one is survey. Uh, the national government is investigating the health of residents of housing that have been renovated. The results show the main uh, results show that the, the insulation renovation improved the comfort of living in the housing and on average lowered uh, lowers the maximum uh, blood pressure. The third one is support for small builders and contractors. Uh, we provide information on energy efficient building technology to small and medium sized uh, builders through, through seminars and subsidy, subsidized. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, I'd like to summarize two things. Uh, first one, uh, in Japan, an uh, increasing number of cities are proclaiming to become zero carbon cities in the year of 2050. We recognize, uh, second one, uh, we recognize that, is, uh, that it is important to important to support local governments with regard to buildings and housing policies. And now I finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Murakami. I think um, it was a very nice illustration of the uh, um, complementarity between the political leadership and commitment that probably translated into uh, this prime minister's statement and the need for uh, not only the the, the stick uh, and regulations and legal framework, but also the carrot and some of the incentives, including financial that you've put in place from the national level to support that trend at local level, which we've seen, by the way, in other uh, areas than energy efficiency in buildings uh, from Japan, the work you're doing amongst others to help cities localize the sustainable development goals is a very good example of um, that that uh, uh, top-down combined with bottom-up um, uh, approach and shared responsibility. Thank you very much for these insights, which I'm sure will uh, trigger a value.
valuable uh, discussion. Let me now move to the third and last country level uh, representative. And it's my pleasure to introduce now Yves Laurent Sapoval. You're the senior advisor in the Ministry of Ecological and Inclusive Transition of France. Um, and uh, France recently announced actually a 100 billion recovery plan uh, back in September. A good third of it is for uh, the green transition and actually close to 7 billion uh, are devoted to energy efficiency retrofits in, in homes and public buildings. There's been quite a, a few debates around that in France. If you could please update us, Yves Laurent, on the, on the current state of play and, and some of the initiatives you're leading in that area. Yes, thank you for uh, giving me the floor here. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting France to this very important meeting. I think that we are all now perfectly aware that with the COVID crisis, uh, the housing question and the way we feel into our buildings is one of the main questions that we will have to address and to tackle as, the, as public uh, uh, policies for the next year. So um, my, I will go through quickly through three questions. What happened in France? What are the priorities that we think that we feel are important? And uh, a few general messages regarding to the life of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so first in France, we have been taking, uh, even before COP21, some strong engagement in, term, in terms of ambitions and uh, targets. Uh, we have uh, been developing for new buildings, a regulation that involves uh, carbon life uh, cycle assessment within the buildings and it's one of the only one I think uh, existing in this way. It is a very um, interesting I think a new uh, uh, new regulation. As of for uh, renovation as you said uh, we had already an ambitious uh, 500,000 housing uh, renovation target before um, but with the recovery plan in, in, in line with the EU efforts uh, and the renovation wave, uh, we have been mobilizing about uh, a little less than 7 billion euros for deep renovation and financing. So um, uh, we think that th this is a very important effort that we are doing because this is a key question. Of course, you know that 80% of the buildings that will be built in 2050 in the world, in the OECD uh, countries, 80% are already built, so they have to be deeply renovated. Third, maybe um, point about the French policy is that it's a, it's, um, uh, we've been setting up a strong partnership between stakeholders. We think it's very important to move on with all the stakeholders, the providers, uh, the um, builders, uh, the uh, uh, and regions and cities are deeply involved into our effort uh, in France. If we have time, I, I might be able to, uh, to explain you that. Uh, so my second thing would be the priorities, along with um, the first thing for the priorities, of course, to stop, uh, to, to begin thinking that energy efficiency is really first. Uh, I think it's not the case, even within the climate uh, discussions, uh, and we really think that we have to end up with the uh, energy switch dream, if I may say so, that we will we could uh, keep the same way of living and just switch the energy to green energy. It will not happen nowhere in the world. And the IEA says that quite clearly, half of the effort will be done through energy efficiency, whatever happens. And all the energy saved is energy that can go to economy, to new technology and to lots of things rather than to warm onto or to cool air. Uh, second thing is, second priority we think is uh, that we need to uh, develop national strategies because we think that uh, public policies are really the main drivers. It is, it has been a, a, a need for, even for private sector, if we want the private sector invest into new solutions, which are able to do, uh, to invest into new material uh, and new techniques, they need to have a long-term vision. And the long-term vision has to be given by the uh, public authority in the, in the globally. Uh, so uh, within that, of course, local authorities and, and countries, uh, sub-national authorities in, in, a, in a vertical integration uh, 
logic uh, has to be uh, fully participating. Uh, there are lots of technical uh, uh, issues at this regard. Uh, one of them is, of course, to be able to measure progress, even for even for households. I mean, if you want to renovate houses, you have to be able to tell to people that they have a certain result guarantee that this is not the case by now, uh, in most of the cases. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention here is some are some general messages in line with the Paris Agreement and in line with your initiative. First, that um, uh, as you all know, uh, with the um, uh, United Nations uh, Environment Program and IEA and lots of other partners, we have been um, uh, setting up and launching at COP21 a global alliance for buildings and constructions that is providing roadmaps and global status report. So I advise you all to have a look at uh, Thursday's presentation of the global status report for 2020. This is an assessment made uh, by the IEA and others uh, as stakeholders uh, uh, and universities to uh, assess the situation yearly on the, on the building energy efficiency questions. And the second thing is that we have been trying to launch with the Climate Chance Association and Global ABC a network of uh, cities and subnationals that are active in the field of energy efficiency in buildings. We have never been really successful, so we are very confident that OECD can take the lead on that and help us developing this network because there is no exchanges between cities uh, on what they can do. Uh, we have some a few exchanges between stakeholders. We have exchanges through uh, between um, um, uh, states and governments. We have very ex interesting exchanges with Japan, very rich exchange in on comparing policies with, uh, with Japan. But within the uh, in cities network, uh, apart from the big cities that are already very, I mean, very uh, uh, in capacity, for small and medium cities, there is no way for them to, uh, to act properly and to get access to this uh, key information. So that will be my conclusion for the, for the moment and hoping to have a very rich debate with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yves Laurent, for uh, sharing those priorities, the importance of strategic and uh, holistic uh, approaches and uh, those uh, uh, existing networks uh, feel free to share via the chat uh, the links uh, to um, uh, all the the panelists and attendees in case uh, their web pages one can refer to or will uh, also try to do this in the follow-up email um, let me invite uh, again the attendees to submit uh, questions they may have to Yves Laurent, but also to the previous two uh, speakers, uh, Joram from the Netherlands and uh, Haru Nobu from Japan. Uh, please do so while we are now turning to the second block and we'll hear from basically subnational governments and uh, stakeholders. So we'll uh, start with Zachary May. Zachary, you're the director for uh, strategic policy within the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing of the of the province of uh, British Columbia, you've been uh, leading a very interesting step code uh, development, uh, a very ambitious uh, building energy code uh, that relied extensively on close collaboration with the private industry, and uh, that has, uh, uh, to my knowledge, helped streamline municipal building energy codes, uh, and at the same time, set quite quite ambitious goals uh, which uh, are aimed for being strengthened in, in the future. If you can tell us a bit more, uh, Zachary, about British Columbia's experience, there have been some announcements made at federal level in Canada as well, uh, which I guess hold the uh, implications for, for your uh, provinces and, and territories amongst others. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks very much for inviting me to this very distinguished panel, and uh, I'm happy to I'm taking all sorts of notes from other jurisdictions and looking forward to continuing this discussion with everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm with the province of British Columbia in Canada, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, some work that we've done in British Columbia uh, that I'd like to share I, that applies to new buildings, I should note, certainly much of our lessons learned are about new buildings, but have taught us how we're going to engage with existing buildings. And I'm happy to hear that others see this as a really complicated challenge. And there is a need for pilot projects and some learning. But 
what we've learned on new buildings in British Columbia uh, has been implemented through a regulation that we call the energy step code. Um, this graphic we see here, I mean, multiple levels of energy efficiency we've, that we've introduced into our building code in British Columbia based on a commitment in Canada that came out of the Paris Accord to make our buildings what they referred to as net zero energy ready by 2032 with no description technically of what that means. And so in British Columbia, we worked with industry stakeholders and said, we've got a commitment by 2032 to make our buildings very, very energy efficient as a minimum standard in our building code. But we don't know how to do that. We don't know what it looks like other than some different examples we see in the market. And so we brought everyone together, industry stakeholders, local governments, those who are already building these buildings, and they exist all around the world in different forms, and said, what does the future look like? And let's put that into regulation. And borrowed an idea from our good friends in Brussels, Belgium, um, who implemented a passive house standard with some modifications with a long timeline. And we did something uh, very similar with a much longer timeline, admittedly, but have found great success with that model. Uh, and what we did is work with stakeholders, describe that end of the road uh, in terms of energy efficiency, which does look more or less kind of like passive house standard. So we've referenced that standard and then also described similar outcomes in technical building code regulation, which is really important for industry. Uh, and what we learned was uh, the, the most important step for us was not to focus on a 10 or 20% improvement in the code, which is how codes usually work, but was to focus on that end goal and describe it in regulatory language, put it into the building code and then figure out, okay, how do you map your way back from where we are today? And that's where our step code uh, maps our way incrementally from where we are today all the way to that 2032 goal. And in subsequent years, we've been able to add commitments around where the building code is going to be and where industry needs to move. And everyone now has a clear roadmap, not just those leading communities, but also those communities in between. We can go to the next slide. What that taught us is the biggest barrier really to progress is actually clarity, long-term clarity in regulation about where buildings need to go for local governments, for industry, for manufacturers, because then everyone can take the time they need to with confidence to invest in the change. Um, what we did find in terms of the way it works, this was an approach that worked well for British Columbia. And what was interesting for us is we were able to leverage the leadership of local governments uh, like the city of Vancouver and other leading cities in British Columbia that have always been leaders on energy efficiency and addressing climate change, but to transition some of that learning to mid-level or more conservative uh, 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 communities that were much smaller and maybe more cautious about moving forward. And so a step code approach allowed us to take the province's role in establishing building codes um, and implementing Canadian and provincial policy, these, these big bold goals of making buildings more energy efficient and put that into regulation to provide the clarity and a roadmap for local governments. And what we've seen locally at least is towns and cities play that leadership role of actually moving the envelope, the, the needle forward on energy efficiency. And so by creating a regulation uh, with multiple steps of energy efficiency. And then we also allowed cities and towns to require these levels as they see fit in their own communities in whatever situation makes sense for them. They knew provincially that we were gonna be moving forward in these steps over the long term, but we allowed them in 2017 to start putting this into their own bylaws and requiring it when they uh, have development processes locally. And what we found is over two years, nearly 70% of our new construction process moved to the energy step code voluntarily and provincially, our next commitment isn't until 2022. We already have the majority of construction in British Columbia there already. And so our ambitious timeline, we're actually exceeding it because we got out of the way of leaders. And what we found is mid-side communities that wouldn't usually be involved in climate leadership are really also leading the way because they can see how it's done from those leading cities that are also using the step code because we have the same standardized uh, uh, approach throughout the province. Next slide, which leads me to uh, ultimately the, uh, the supports that we really need. What we found is that uh, not surprisingly, traditional barriers need to be removed. We need uh, training for capacity building and improving skills in the market and financial incentives and support to um, support emerging technologies, high performance heat pumps and ventilation systems and high performance windows, things like that. What we also found is that we need to integrate the change across society. So this means aligning regulatory signals, not just in building codes, but also in product standards, uh, gas safety codes, electrical codes, 
all these signals need to be adjusted because we found they're not all pointing in the same direction. And that's a, that's a, a discussion that needs to continue. And that also needs to go beyond just technical standards and policies, but also just generally we found we need to now work with insurance providers. We work with people who are doing government procurement, the real estate sector. Everyone needs to understand what the transition is and start communicating it in the, their own language for their industry. And then last, especially for existing buildings, what we found is there is a lack of data about how buildings are being built. So what are the assets out there and how are they operating? And are we actually getting the outcomes that we expected? We need to build public confidence if we're going to have huge investments in the built environment. And that's a really uh, missing piece that we think uh, that regulation in particular and uh, when buildings are built and applying building codes that we need to start gathering data as part of that process and disclosing that and making sure that's available to everyone so that we can have better decision making and better measurement of whether different policies are effective or not. With that, thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Zachary. And I see there are already a few questions uh, for your consideration. I'll be giving you the floor later uh, to address uh, um, that one in particular that relates to the role of, of citizens uh, in those initiatives. Let me now turn to our uh, next panelist, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paula Ray Garcia, who's the deputy head of the unit at the European Commission, uh, DG Energy, that deals with energy efficiency in buildings and, and products. We know that the commission recently uh, released uh, a renovation wave strategy back in October, which aims to uh, renovate 35 million uh, buildings and create up to 160,000 uh, additional green jobs by 2030. You have a number of other initiatives, including a facility that uh, you, you shared with me a few months ago, uh, Elena, to engage directly with cities and local governments, a, a stock database, and many uh, other uh, tools that I'm sure will be extremely uh, relevant for the audience. Paula, if you can take us through uh, some of the work and messages of the Commission in this field. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon to, to everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to, to take part in this, in this webinar and to make the link as well to the Renovation Wave strategy that uh, we adopted last October. Um, if we can then start, yeah, okay, I see that now the slides are, are available. Thank you very much for that. So our aim in fact with the renovation wave strategy that we adopted uh, in October is to um, tackle some of the issues that were mentioned uh, and I was very interested to see that by the previous speakers because in fact we tried to put in motion a political and a strategic vision for the EU for the building sector which was something that as it was mentioned before used to be a very very technical field and not properly integrated across the different angles that it uh, cuts across. So the idea is really to put in place this, this strategy, this uh, vision for a transformation of the building sector, and then to mobilize action at all levels over the coming years with the aim uh, that we state in the renovation wave of uh, boosting renovation rates, but at the same time also trying to put incentives in place and to foster um, deeper levels of, of renovation. We uh, place really this renovation wave strategy in the context of our climate neutrality context, the decarbonization of the building stock. And we consider that uh, because of the reasons that were mentioned already and, and the figures for um, energy consumption in the building sector that in fact uh, tackle this sector is really a precondition to meeting our climate targets and really also essential in a, in a recovery context. So um, in this regard, we also highlight in the renovation waste strategy, the many benefits that come together with this climate and energy goals. So this has to do with well-being, but also with quality on life, um, with job creation, which is even uh, more important for a green recovery. And in this context, what we have also uh, done with the Renovation Wave Strategy is to identify um, really the focus areas uh, for policy and for finance in the years to come. So in this slide uh, that you can see now, 
you will see that um, these focus areas are in fact three. The first one is really tackling energy poverty and worst performing buildings. Uh, the second one has to do with uh, placing the priority on public buildings and on social infrastructure. And there we put particular um, attention into uh, social housing where it is defined like that, but more generally also affordable housing. And then um, uh, office buildings in the case of, of uh, public um, administration buildings, but then as well, we put quite a lot of attention on hospitals and on schools. And the third focus area is uh, building decarbonization and the decarbonization of heating and cooling. And in these slides, you can also see that in fact, we, as part of the strategy, we have made an effort to really look into all the main barriers that still hinder building renovation from happening. Because in fact, this is not a new area of EU policy, is not a new area of financing for energy efficiency in the EU. We have acquired quite a lot of, of experience, but at the same time, we see that there are still many barriers that prevent building renovation from happening. So we have also, as part of the preparation of the renovation wave, uh, looked into all those factors that could act as pull factors for making renovation happen at much bigger scale. And those are related to uh, regulation that was mentioned already by several speakers, to financing, which is really fundamental for, for fostering and, and really uh, amplifying um, building renovation levels together with technical assistance. And then also um, we have also identified poor factors in relation to governance and to participatory approaches. So if we uh, move them into the next slide, please. So um, as, as uh, we should only spend um, in these in this slides a couple of minutes, I would like to highlight just a few key messages. And the first one is really that the renovation wave should be a shared project across Europe. So it will never be successful in the way we have defined it. And in fact, I forgot to mention it, that in the previous slide, you have the link really to the, to the strategy and the documents that were adopted together with it, and they are all available on our website. Uh, but it really needs to be a shared project. It will never be successful if it relies alone on action by the European Commission or on action by um, other EU institutions on their own. What we see is that uh, really concerted action is necessary at all governance levels and also in an integrated manner, because um, this was mentioned already as well, um, that uh, that really is an area that cuts across different policy fields and stakeholders. So that really an integrated approach involving all of them is really very important. So the second message is that um, really local and regional authorities have a, a very central role to play. Uh, because of, of uh, their situation sometimes in charge of renovation projects, the role often in, in the removal of uh, administrative barriers or local barriers, or also their possibility to steer finance into renovation projects. So in this regard, uh, from the Commission side, we have been working in close partnership with the Covenant of Mayors, uh, with also the Committee of the Regions, Smart Cities Marketplace, but we have also, as part of the renovation wave, intensified quite significantly um, the, the support that we give for technical assistance. Elena was mentioned as an example, but there are many others, such as, for instance, the city facility or the work that we are doing with the European Investment Bank to somehow standardize one-stop shops so that they can be rolled out um, more easily at national, regional, and local levels to deliver also tailored advice and, and financing solutions. And if we move to the next slide, please. And I so will invite part, you to please start wrapping up, uh, Paula, if you yeah, can. This is the last slide. So the third message is really that the renovation of existing buildings is really uh, not only a unique opportunity, as I was mentioning, for reaching the EU targets, but also essential to recovery. So in this regard, there will be quite a, a massive amount of funds available at EU level, and it would be really important 
that also at local, regional, and national level, this is identified as a priority area, building renovation for those renovation programs. So with this, I'm moving to the final slide. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paula, we'll come back to you in the Q&A. And let me now turn to our last speaker, uh, Sara de Pablos, your Environmental and Social Sustainability Advisor at the Council of Europe uh, Development Bank. We know one of the things you are doing at CEB is to fund cities and regions in their projects on energy efficiency renovations. You've recently released uh, an interesting technical brief uh, on that front. If you can take us through some of the opportunities uh, and challenges uh, uh, that uh, you've come across in terms of the local level uh, from a financial perspective. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to present our experience as a financier. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, let me briefly introduce you to the Council of Europe Development Bank. So, we are a multilateral development bank with a regional scope. Uh, we are the oldest international financial institution in Europe and the only one with an exclusively social mandate. So, we have now three main strategic priorities. First, inclusive growth, support of vulnerable groups, and finally, environmental sustainability, including mitigation and adaptation to climate change. We also intend to focus more uh, on further engaging with cities and region. Next slide. Uh, CB has a unique mandate of promoting social cohesion in Europe. So we are a natural partner for regions and cities. Indeed, subnational governments are responsible for a quarter of all public expenditures and almost half of all public investment in our region. Uh, so CB engagement with uh, cities and regions intends to increase flexible financing for local investments to upgrade and reduce gaps in social infrastructure. Next slide. So uh, as uh, we, we finance uh, subnational and ha we have been increasing the financing in the last years. And the concerning decarbonization, um, the CB has been financing energy efficiency renovation of buildings for a long time. Uh, we have been uh, financing since 22, 2.4 billion euros uh, approved in favor of projects wholly or partially concerned with energy efficiency. Our main focus is in line with our priorities, energy renovation of social housing, national public programs, public buildings and services from local and regional authorities, as well as energy efficiency needs for SMEs and homeowners through financial intermediaries. CEB supports the carbonization of buildings uh, by cities and regions, mainly through direct loans for energy efficiency renovation of their own assets. Uh, in addition, energy efficiency renovation is included as a component of most CEB loans to cities and regions, even if it's not the main objective of the investments. Because experience uh, has shown that decarbonizing buildings is increasingly a priority for these counterparties that are mainstreaming this aspect into all their activities. Next slide, please. Uh, so I would like to present some of the lessons learned from uh, CEB engagement in these sectors. First, energy efficiency renovations are linked to very specific local conditions. For example, the type of building stock, socioeconomic context, institutional, geographical, and climatic context. Um, therefore, specific solutions have to be decided at local level for undertaking such renovations. In addition, um, the energy efficiency market is highly fragmented. Therefore, larger financial flows have to be aggregated by a single entity such as the subnationals that are more equipped to interface with international financial institutions such as, such as CEB. Um, local authorities can also optimize their financing uh, by making best use of available national or EU uh, support programs and using innovative financing planning instruments. Uh, further, um, in our experience, investment programs are more effective when carefully designed based on relevant energy and climate studies and strategies, leading particularly to clearly defined targets. However, uh, measuring and monitoring of these targets and the results may be challenging for cities and regions. Next slide, please. So it has been recognized that decarbonizing buildings is a win-win-win strategy for recovery as illustrated just uh, before by the European Renovation Wave Strategy. 
um, not only the energy renovation of building uses local companies and creates local jobs, it has also significant social co-benefits, including the reduction in energy poverty, while it also can play an important role in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Cities and regions have a key role to play in decarbonizing the building stock. It is important to build back better locally uh, with specific conditions and therefore contribute to an inclusive and climate resilient recovery while particularly enhancing social benefits at the local level. Uh, one of the main challenges for cities and regions, in addition to obtaining the financing necessary for building <laughs> the decarbonization, concerns the data. Assessment of the needs of aggregated targets at local level, uh, as well as progress monitoring and measuring of potential benefits and policy outcomes has been identified in many cases as uh, shortcoming. Uh, next slide. Well, thank you so much. We, we have issued, as uh, Aziza mentioned, a couple of technical briefs on the issue, the latest years. So very much encouraged to, to have a look at our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and uh, feel free to share via the chat uh, with uh, panelists and attendees uh, the links to the briefs um, if you if you wish to uh, to uh, uh, generate interest uh, and and get them to read. Um, let us now get into a good 15 minutes of uh, Q&A and many thanks to those that have uh, submitted uh, very interesting questions online. Some have been partly responded uh, via the chat, but I'll uh, flag some of them in particular. I'll try to pick two questions per speakers and I will uh, start with you, uh, Joram. Um, there is a, a question on whether you can elaborate a bit on how citizen and community members uh, contribution were integrated with uh, innovative technical solutions for district uh, renovation. We know you have in the Netherlands a long-standing culture of the polder uh, approach, which may or may not be an incentive uh, if you can take us through um, some of this community engagement. And if you have any practical examples from the municipal pilots that uh, you've mentioned, that would be appreciated. And if I can add to that a second question, after hearing the presentation from um, uh, Paula from uh, DG Energy and, uh, and latest developments around the Green Deal and the EU Recovery Fund, if you can take us through uh, some of the big differences that this is making for a country like yours, the Netherlands, in terms of uh, accelerating your effort in this, uh, in this field of energy efficiency? Does this raise new opportunities uh, or, or basically for the front runners, you were uh, pretty much uh, aligned? Uh, if, if you can address those two questions and then I'll move to um, Japan uh, for the, the next two. Yes, uh, thank you. Very good questions indeed. Uh, so I'll start first with the involvement of uh, local uh, citizens in the, the district projects. So yes, all municipalities, um, when they apply for the district oriented approach, they have to submit the participation plan. So how are we going to involve the people living in the particular neighborhood? So there are many different ways on how to do that. And we are also going to figure out which ways work best, of course. Um, but it's good to to mention that quite a few already bottom-up initiatives so for example especially very small villages there were a couple of examples where the village of only a couple of hundred people said we would like to become carbon neutral and uh, they submitted a plan and uh, the municipality cooperated with this local initiative and submitted it to the national government. So that's how we try to work together um, with, the, with regard to uh, innovation and in innovative techniques. We do see that a lot of people, uh, especially from bottom-up approaches, prefer reliability over uh, innovation. So they, they more often opt for uh, the district heating, the, the, tested, the, the already tested technologies. So uh, very new initiatives are often not coming from the people themselves because they are scared that they will uh, uh, remain uh, in a cold house when something goes wrong of course so that's for the first question and then um yes uh, with regard to the european developments we are very happy with the renovation wave and the work the european commission is doing um, i think it's an excellent example of how 
the European Commission has asked uh, atten attention for this big challenge and we look forward to cooperating with uh, the many countries in Europe uh, some say the Netherlands is a front runner, but when you look at how much renewable energy and actual um, sustainable buildings there are in the Netherlands, we are not a, a front runner at all. So there's still a lot of catching up to do and we can really use the, the help from the European Commission and also from other countries, of course, to reach it. So we are very happy uh, with that. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Joram. And if I can ask a question to uh, Mr. Murakami, uh, and it's actually a question of my own, it may not be easy to, to respond, and in particular from the ministry, but I'd be uh, curious to know um, if you have one or two leading examples of uh, cities in Japan that you think are uh, really ahead of the curve uh, in terms of, uh, of addressing this decarbonization of buildings, uh, whether they have or not benefited from uh, the support of MLIT and the ministry already, uh, but, but if you have one or two uh, examples that you would say uh, really are inspiring for other countries, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is whether you see in Japan um, a, a question or, or a set of challenges related to the scale or the size of the city. Would you say that uh, large, big uh, metropolitan areas uh, or megalopolis like Tokyo, for example, or Osaka or, or others are, um, have, have a, a, are in a much better position to solve this uh, problem? Or, or would you say, on the other hand, that uh, mid-sized cities are probably where um, most of the, let's Let's say a uh, challenge can be addressed uh, uh, in, in the short term. It, it, have you seen anything related to the, the size of municipalities for uh, the, the scale or the magnitude of the action that is, uh, that is needed? And if you have one or two ex examples that can be inspiring. Mr. Muramaki, Murakami? Okay, thank you. Uh, first one, reading project uh, about reading project. Uh, local government in Japan is, are working to improve energy efficiency, energy self efficient. Uh, sorry, uh, local governments are working to improve energy self efficiency rate of the region, energy efficiency in housing and building, and create compact cities for the decarbonization. The national government can provide assistance and similar dissemination of information as a good practice for such leading uh, cases of local, local government. And concerning uh, the second question, uh, and in Japan, national government prepares a, a story. Uh, some local governments impose environment environmental considerations on buildings such as CASB, fan the housing and buildings of a certain size of larger uh, uh, build, built. Uh, also, uh, the number of local government degradation zero carbon city is increasing and the number is 188 at present. Then, uh, uh, that's, that is my answer of those. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Let me now turn to Zachary. Maybe, uh, Zachary, two questions for you. You've partly started to respond. The first one on whether you can say a bit more on the Belgian example that you provided and on which you've based your uh, work. Um, and then uh, there's a question on whether you, you think that Canadian policies for um, the stock of existing buildings, but also new constructions are consistent with the national goal of, of reaching the net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050. I mean, this is a big federal country where you have, of course, uh, uh, asymmetric levels of achievement from one uh, province or territory to another. But if you have a, an overall federal picture uh, also in line with the latest uh, communications that were made, that could be interesting. Zachary? Uh, sure thing. And I'll share a link afterwards. Uh, there's a report that compared the example in Brussels to what we've been doing in British Columbia. 
the short story is that I believe in 2007, they introduced a building code, which is why I got interested. That's the most exciting thing for me uh, is building codes. They uh, committed to in regulation by 2015, I believe, requiring passive house levels of construction um, for their new construction and then rolled out the BATEX program uh, Batiment Exemplaire, I think, was the name of the program. Lots of incentive dollars to support builders and provide them incentives to build to that future standard so that by the time the regulation came in, the market had already shifted. Um, and so we, uh, we implemented, I would say, a, a modified version of that in British Columbia with a, we have a more complicated context. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I'll be happy to share a link uh, to that. It was a really interesting example to show how regulations need to lead the transition. They shouldn't be the end of the transition in terms of the traditional market transformation curve. That was a really important lesson for us. And I would say we've, we've replicated that same kind of transition where once you put it in regulation, the leaders lead and they take you faster than you thought you could go. Uh, that's, that's been really amazing for us. As it relates to Canada's commitment to be, I think it's net zero carbon by 2050 and province of British Columbia quickly, I think, followed up to also commit to that with some incremental changes along the way. In buildings, uh, oddly enough, though, in Canada, we only regulate energy efficiency. So just energy use regardless of carbon emissions in Canada today. That's starting to shift. And that's what I'm seeing in the signals from the, uh, the messages from the prime minister and certainly in British Columbia, we're looking to also address carbon. In Canada, electricity is uh, very clean, usually hydroelectricity in many provinces. And even those who are using coal or uh, natural gas today are shifting to uh, low carbon alternatives, wind and solar and other approaches. So generally speaking, the future is electric in buildings in Canada, and that's a low carbon future. That tends to be the story across the world, low energy to enable that low carbon um, transformation. Um, and so the, the next step for us in British Columbia, probably in the next year, we'll be starting to implement uh, regulations to regulate carbon emissions in buildings alongside energy. Some local governments have been doing that already, but uh, today in Canada, we're not quite there in building codes. And that's, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of complicated reasons for why that's the case, but I think that's true around the world as well. But I think that's been an advantage. I think if we started trying to tackle carbon first, that's a much more political discussion and the implications have some real cost implications for society. Uh, everyone seems to agree that improved energy efficiency makes sense. Builders agree with it. And we've been able to make a lot of progress on energy efficiency first. And now that we've got that motivation, we can have an engaged discussion about also addressing carbon um, we need to urgently if we're going to address the uh, commitments in the Paris Accord. But um, uh, that starting with energy has been effective for us. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Zachary. Let me now turn to Eve. Uh, Eve, there was a, a question, and I know uh, most of your available documentation is in French, but if you wish to take a minute uh, to elaborate on that, on, on whether you have specific examples of, of mechanisms or policies that can promote and, and finance deep renovation in France, if you can share an example or two. And if I can uh, be the devil's advocate, um, uh, one of the, of the of the big headaches that we often hear uh, in France as being a sort of major barrier or obstacle to that energy renovation is the way uh, the copropriété work uh, and the governance of decision making and some of the split incentives that this is generating. And someone was putting earlier in the chat the lack of incentives and the lack of awareness of the uh, citizens for that transition to happen. If you can, if you can share your views on that um, and, and, and any solution that uh, have proven successful uh, to change a bit the mindset and speed up, uh, let's say, the decision making uh, within the, the building owners themselves. Thank you for those two questions, even being the devil's advocate. <laughs> we share this point of view, so uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a preoccupation, of course. Uh, first thing is um, um, some a few solutions. Uh, so I advise you if if possible to have a look at Ma Prime Renov or the Habite Mieux program. We have a program that, that aims to uh, 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 tackle the question of energy scarcity for uh, the lowest income um, households. Uh, so we have a very efficient program that was led by ANA, the uh, French agency for, uh, for housing, for Habitat, that is mainly an agency uh, to, to promote renovation uh, of uh, housing. 
and they are uh, not only giving um, incentives or uh, such as uh, grants, loans, uh, zero loans, and uh, and even uh, fiscal uh, incentives, they are also providing engineering for the households to help the households to evaluate the, the work they have to do uh, and the result they will gain from that. And I think this is very important because the support you can give to households is, is key in those matters. This is what makes things so complicated. I mean, if you change a car, you change a line of product, you, you change a, a, a motorization, and then you change millions of cars. But uh, it's for, for housing and for buildings, it's a, it's a million of small decisions that you have to that you have to add. So you really need to assist those people to take to make their decisions. And this would be the case also because we have been having some results in the multi-property uh, uh, buildings. It is true that is that is that this is really complicated to make people um, uh, decide within those multi-property uh, buildings to make proper renovations. So two things have been done. First, a, a certain number of uh, renovations have, have been made mandatory. If you do globally, uh, to make it simple, if you do a big renovation, you have, if you renovate your facade, for example, you have to make it uh, uh, an energy efficient renovation. So this is called what we call the travaux embarqués, let's say embarked works. <laughs> so if you do big, uh, if you change your uh, roof, for example, you have to, to, to be energy efficient. This is the, let's say this is a stick. And the carrot is that we've been also implementing some assistance for uh, co-properties. Co, uh, 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 and it, it's each time you, you go and take the time to explain and give the proper incentives, you get the point, but it's not that easy. I think, and if you give me the opportunity, I think that OECD, we will be happy to participate to a study uh, on uh, this question of uh, the multi-property uh, uh, decision-making process within the OECD uh, countries, because it is, a, it is a key element. I know it is a key element in the Eastern countries, for example, what, I, what we call Eastern countries like the ex, um, uh, for example, the ex-communist countries that because the property has been transferred without properly, without always the, the obligation, the, the mandatory things that goes with. Well, anyway, I'm, I, could, yeah. I could speak for hours in, uh, regarding that, but please have a look at the Maprim Renov site. It is an interesting one. And to the Habite Mieux program, uh, you'll see lots of incentives that we have, and I'll be happy to provide all our incentives and try to translate a few of them for you if you want to. Good. Thank you very much, Yves Laurent. And if you wish to share the web pages to both uh, examples, uh, very uh, spot on, uh, even if in French, uh, most will make good use of it. Let me now turn to Paula. Paula, there is a question about why there's not been more market capitalization across the construction industry, and in particular, how you can explain that 94% uh, of EU construction firms um, have uh, fewer than 10 employees. There are some uh, good points that were made on the chat, uh, including in terms of subcontractors contracting, but if you've seen this as an issue at EU level uh, and, and can share uh, some tips. And then a second question on whether uh, you could give some details on the energy neutral uh, versus energy positive uh, system, if this is a conversation you've had uh, very shortly in a minute or two. Well, thank you very much. It's a bit uh, quite, quite intense questions for maybe just the remaining minute. As regards the construction industry, that's um, in fact the reality across the EU is mainly really uh, very small uh, players and also very local. That's also why we see that putting in place a renovation wave um, on the ground and also engaging very closely with the construction sector would have quite a, an important effect also in terms of, of job uh, creation and, and recovery. And as regards the question on, on uh, positive buildings um, versus the carbonization, there, unfortunately, I could not read the questions coming in. So I didn't get exactly the, the gist of the question, 
Um, but what we see, in fact, is that there are uh, different approaches that we could and uh, should integrate in order to meet the challenge of, of uh, having a climate neutral building stock. And there, um, it could be that a different balance of, of uh, mix of technologies uh, could vary from country to country and also in different uh, regions and, and municipalities. And the idea is really to not prescribe a one size fits all, but to try to really facilitate all this, um, being very active and, and moving forward, uh, each of them at uh, their own pace and in a way that really fits into the local environment. Thank you so much, Paula. And Sarah, maybe this last one for you. Uh, I know you've been working extensively with different cities and including recently with Genoa on these uh, discussions. And there's one question about how to decarbonize suburban way of living when the living style primarily or still heavily relies on cars uh, and how urban planning does it share uh, out of this. And we've seen COVID-19 uh, shake somewhat some of the traditional consumption, production and mobility patterns in, in cities, is this something that comes from some of your clients uh, when when you uh, sound uh, their their needs uh, in in this field? Uh, yes, indeed, it's it's a it's an important question because uh, it is true that there is a lot uh, of interest now in <clears throat> sustainable transport in developing. Uh, uh, low carbon mobilities, um, and uh, and it's true that we have been financing more and more of these projects, uh, small projects uh, for the moment, for uh, for developing lo low carbon mobility. Uh, we also finance uh, other activities uh, through cities like uh, bicycle paths, uh, for example, or. Other, other activities that uh, uh, the municipalities have been engaged, particularly since uh, the recovery during the emergency as uh, public transport was, was stopped. So this is something that, that is true we have seen coming um, and uh, may help uh, suburban um, low carbon activities. So it, indeed, uh, th this, is, uh, this is going through. It is a low change also uh, because of course, we still rely, rely much on uh, uh, cars, but also we have been seeing that, uh, for, for, for example, leasing companies are increasingly doing um, electric cars and increasingly financing electric cars for, for inhabitants. So this is something that, that uh, everybody should look at to, to develop uh, uh, low carbon mobilities. Thank you so much. And uh, I see it's two minutes past, so we'll uh, bring this uh, webinar to a conclusion now. I'd like to thank all the panelists for having been not only stimulating, but also very precise and concise. And that was not an easy job given the magnitude of the work you're doing in this field. I'll uh, invite those of you uh, who want to know more about this work, uh, and if there are some cities or countries uh, online who wish to join uh, the club of, uh, of uh, champion cities and countries engaged in this work uh, over the coming weeks to uh, contact uh, our colleague uh, Atsuhito Oshima. Uh, his email was put online and, uh, and uh, inquire more about the next steps. Uh, we'll be working hand in hand with uh, Japan and the Netherlands uh, to get started, hopefully uh, with British Columbia uh, soon as well. And we take due note of, uh, of uh, France's uh, proposal to look more in depth at the governance uh, of this, which uh, certainly from a decision-making standpoint is uh, extremely enlightening for many countries. And of course, we'll uh, be continuing the cooperation with our uh, European uh, counterparts, uh, DG Energy and the Council of the uh, Europe uh, Development Bank. Thank you all so much uh, for uh, your time and for today's conversation. Many thanks and hats off to Atsuhito Oshima in particular for uh, uh, pioneering this program, which I'm sure will be bearing a lot of fruits and uh, stay tuned um, to access the recording of the webinar uh, over the coming uh, days. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day uh, or the evening. Bye-bye.